And I want to welcome everyone. I see familiar faces, and it's so great to be doing this, so great to be bringing this international experience to Leslie, um, and to be doing it from a kind of home base in my home, but also at Leslie. So it's really a chance for all worlds to come together. Um, I will begin the presentation uh, by reading just a few pages or a couple of pages. I will read quickly just to get us all oriented to this project. And then we're going to break up into you know, separate presentations. Um, in terms of the questions and answers, we did not really uh, somehow arrive at a proper system. So we suggest people put questions in chats. Um, and if you have an urgent question at the end, you can also raise your hand and we will somehow figure it all out. Um, and we'll see what, what our time frame, how we move through our presentations because we have so much to talk about. Um, so I will begin this presentation with the assumption that many people here have never heard of the Jungfernhof concentration camp and you are not alone. In fact, the hidden nature of the camp's history sits at the core of our work. I will deliver a short introduction of the camp, highlighting two critical turning points in the project that changed our orientation to the site. Locker of Memory is a multimedia memorial project dealing with the history and legacy of genocide at the Jungfernhof concentration camp, Latvia's first Nazi concentration camp. In December of 1941, four different transports from Nuremberg, Stuttgart, Vienna, and Hamburg brought 3,985 German and Austrian Jews to the camp. Up to 800 prisoners were killed or died of inhumane treatment during that first winter, and up to another 2,000 uh, were murdered in the Brichenecki Forest massacre on March 26, 1942. The camp closed in 1944, and only 100 and 48 persons survived. I established the project in 2019. The project team was developed over a period of two years. The clarity of our mission came into focus over the last few months in the production of three projects. The 3D tour, a 20 minute video entitled Jungfernhof Absences and Presences and a deportation video. I will take this moment to thank the German embassy in Latvia for funding all three projects and also to thank Lesley University and especially Ellen, Eileen Kraunauer for serving as our fiscal sponsor. In 2019, before embarking on a memorial project, I was given the challenge to look for a mass grave purported to be at the site containing up to 800 bodies. We spent a year looking around the site, wondering where that grave was. I contacted Richard, Dr. Richard Frond, a world-renowned archaeologist who was willing to bring a team of geophysicists to the site. In, 2000, in, in July 2021, we were given the first round of indicators locating two mass graves near the edge of the camp. The second challenge occurred in response to the 3D camera to film the camp. Initially, the plan was to make a tour of the camp. We did not anticipate the camera's insistence to document what was visible. So a newly manicured public park designed for leisure and recreation had obscured our primary focus, which was the camp. The Jungfernhof concentration camp was now an idea, not a reality. As a result, we could no longer exclude 800 years of layered history at the site. We had to modify our plan to tell a different story about the interaction of five distinct narratives at the site. However, the Jungfernhof concentration camp is the only narrative that remained invisible until the discovery of the mass grave, which has forever changed the topography of the park. We now exist at the site. We now have a documented history of inhabiting the site and visitors to this beautiful park must now acknowledge the land's disturbing history of genocide and vice versa, we must find a way to coexist within this beautiful park. So the 3D tour is the most complicated component of the, park, of the project to date. However, there are additional challenges. As a team, we live in five countries, including five states in the US. We speak different languages and represent six different cultures and four different disciplines. As a working group, we have never had a face-to-face -face meeting 
Only four of the 14 members of the core team have ever been to the Jungfernhof concentration camp. And I'm referring to three Latvians uh, and myself. The, the shortage of money and time is a constant concern. And the date for opening events last November was canceled because of the COVID epidemic, epidemic. And we are now planning another event for July 4th, Latvia's Holocaust Remembrance Day, uh, which may be canceled due to the uncertainty of the Ukrainian crisis. So I want to briefly um, introduce the panelists and then we're going to move right into the presentation. Um, and let me just share the screen of the panelists so you can see um, that these are our panelists for today. Um, and I will begin with um, H. Uzunkaya, um, a double major in neuroscience and physics. Um, it is now a cutting edge tech uh, designer. Um, and she worked with Zan, um, who was a student at Brandeis. We will move from that team to the Latvian team. And Ilya is here to represent the Latvian team. There were two other people missing, Eugene and Nick, um, both videographers on the team. We will then move to the design team with Shalini Prasad as the integrative designer and Marissa Wandry, who was a student at Leslie. We will then move to the history team um, headed by our chief historian, Dr. Richard Splavniks with Evan Robbins and Fred Zimek, and then with um, Cabin Levinson who will help facilitate our chat. Um, and he's a technologist, web developer and strategic consultant. Um, okay, I'm going to close this and turn it over to H without taking more time. Hi, uh, so uh, I would like to first show you what the tour looks like, uh, and then we're gonna talk about what we did to collaborate uh, with a group that was you know, so widely spread out and have uh, such unique expertise. So um, first of all, if you go to our website, um, you can see our tour, I don't know if everybody can see this. One sec. Uh, our tour and 3D uh, tour area. Uh, so I will uh, show it from my uh, personal browser because my internet is pretty slow. But uh, when you start the tour, uh, so let me just refresh the page, uh, you immediately get onto this memory map um, um, window. Uh, and you can select any of these uh, sites. So we have eight sites. And over here, we have a little bit of an explanation of why these sites are important. Uh, so I will start with Shkertov. And as, as you can see, uh, if I go on top of it, it highlights the area that's uh, on the map. So uh, if you want to dive directly in, you can click on one of these uh, locations and go in. Uh, but if you want to learn a little bit more about how to interact around the tour, you can click on this info button, uh, and it will show us uh, what each symbol uh, uh, mean. So over here we have, you know, 360 movement, so you can use your mouse to look around. Uh, you can use the arrows to click around and move from 360 ground images to the next uh, position. Uh, the red dots indicate drone footage, so this is higher up level uh, 360 images, while the blue dots uh, uh, indicate, indicate the ground level 360 images. And also at any point, if you want to return to memory map, you can click on this uh, this uh, symbol and it will bring you back to that main um, map that we saw. Over here we have a back button for mini maps. So these are our mini maps. Uh, it will uh, change according to the site. Uh, and here we have audio files. So we have uh, incredible um, um, historical information that's been gathered by our uh, history, te uh, history team. And uh, you can see some of the audio files that they have recorded over there. So uh, here, if you see any of this uh, hexagonal shape, uh, and click on it, uh, that will be a different type of hotspot. So it could be, in this case, it's photos, uh, but it could be something else as well. And these are uh, the silhouettes mean uh, there's a narrator. So if you click on that, you'll see a uh, narrator uh, explain the site. So uh, let me get out of this info scene and start with uh, Shkirtava. So uh, oh, even, even then my internet is uh, pretty slow. Sorry about that. Uh, so, okay, uh, here we have the map of Shkirtava. So, uh, as you can see, we have all of these points and uh, red uh, dot indicates drone level and blue uh, indicates ground level. So I will click on uh, one of the ground ones and it will load for me. And this is uh, right behind the train station. So as you can see, we have a radar. So if I turn around, this is uh, telling me which direction I'm, 
I'm facing. And here we have a narrator. So if you click on this, hopefully Ilya will start talking in a second. My internet is really slow. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, Ilya's narration point is over now here. standing oh, there it is. student of a railway station. From early 20th century, this was Riga's freight train yard and train repair workshop. This was the destination where arrived all the trains with deportees from Germany, Austria, and Czech Republic. So, um, um, you know, because we don't have that much time, um, I'm going to go on to the next, uh, you know, photo or a ground image. So over here we have arrows again, so I can go back to where that narrator was on my uh, first uh, image over here. You know, bring me back here. Uh, so if you want to move around on the map, as you can see, I'm jumping between points here uh, and you can move around the tour. Uh, so I will keep on walking around. Is it loads? And um, over here, we're right in front of uh, the Shkirtava uh, train station. Uh, and we have some hotspots here. So if I hover on top of this, you'll notice this uh, um, artifact or um, um, item highlight. And over here, we have uh, a construction that's highlighted. So if we click over here, this is the monument. So this is the only monument that's in front of uh, the uh, Shkirtava uh, rail railway uh station that is a uh, monument um for the deport the ones who are departed from that train station so you can click over here and it will open up uh, a, a web page that has more um you know information about this and you can also go through these photos as well uh, and over here we have another photo of explanation of the importance of that monument and uh, importance of this train station so you can interact with different hotspots and narrators uh, around the tour you can also go over here and uh, you know click on these uh, spots uh, you know those dots uh, individually so i can jump between points and as you can see it brings me over right in front of uh, this train station over here uh, the Shkirtava train station. Uh, and if I keep moving over here, notice that I'll be jumping to the blue spots. That, that's because we're on information level three, which we, which I will uh, um, talk with uh, you know, later on uh, when, when it's our turn with Shalini. So over here, we're missing the, the red one. Uh, so that's the drone level. I'll click on that to show you what that looks like. Um, and this is our bird's eye view uh, shots with, with a drone can look around like that as well. If I want to go back to the uh, the minimap information over here, we uh, go back to the minimap level. And uh, this is a little bit of information about the site. Uh, and if I go go to Jungfernhof, for example, you can move down here. Uh, and let's say I click on, so this is the start of uh, the train station, I mean, um, uh, concentration camp area. So it will load. For me. And as you can see, we have some hotspots here. Uh, we have another narrator here, uh, which will load, but I don't, uh, my internet again, uh, sorry about that. Uh, and you can see that we can walk around here. But as you're walking around, you can also, you might want to listen to some of the, the recordings. Uh, so for that, you can just click on this uh, area and uh, we can also listen to these uh, recordings if it loads. In the months me. before the Dunamunda action. Can everybody Nearly hear all that? inmates at Jungfernhof were forced to work in the camp. According to Bert. Did I share without sharing sound? Um, but so you can also listen to the audio recordings here and walk around uh, the tour. Uh, we have eight sites. Uh, so if we go back to the memory map, uh, we can also go to Bikerneki Forest, for example, uh, and you can see uh, the you know different sites uh, by clicking on uh, the different sites. So this is what it looks like um, when it's not covered in snow, for example. Uh, so uh, this was um, how you know the tour turned out. Uh, but to be able to get to that, uh, we did a lot of work. Uh, and um, this tour was made in about two months. So we had a lot of time to prepare for it, to get a lot of historical facts. But once you have 
um, everything ready. Putting that together takes quite a bit of time and detail. Uh, so we needed help from the design team uh, for the looks of it. So Shalini and Marissa helped a lot with that. Uh, the history uh, side, uh, the archivist also uh, collected a lot of information, but we couldn't display all of that because uh, you know some ideas are not fully developed some of them uh you know we needed to find a better way of displaying that uh so uh, we had uh you know a general uh, design document so i will share again uh a general design document where we talked about different parts of the the project uh this was uh kind of you know a way to help put uh, visual parts uh, together. So over here we have, you know, the overview. Uh, so we talked about like what type of platform we would want to use, uh, but also details of the uh, the tour. So we have one main tour that is from Shikyotawa train station down to Yungfernaf, uh, and then we have satellite tour. So these are the other sites, uh, and we also had photos of where the 360 images were taken, uh, where you know we wanted to uh, position different points and um, have information about those spots as well. So um, this was kind of how we communicated in the, in the back end and we could go back to it and talk about it. But in the case of the design team, so this we will uh, talk with Shalini more about this. Um, there was certain things that you know the tech team didn't really consider uh, until the design team uh, arrived, and Shalini and Marissa, um, you know, told us what we should be doing. Uh, so here, for example, we have different levels of information as we talked about, and uh, this was you know the. Um, Jamboard sessions or these type of drawing sketching sessions were important so that we could get to the visuals uh, that we wanted to get to. So uh, before I take it, you know, uh, you know, I can keep on talking about this for for a while. Uh, I want to pass it to Zan uh, just so that uh, uh, she can talk a little bit about her end. Uh, Zan did a lot of. Um, um, like crunch time work where she had to put all of these information together uh, and make it visually uh, and technically work together. So uh, in that one month, uh, Zan worked a lot of long hours to stitch everything together, so. Thanks, Sage. Yeah, so what Aisha showed you was the final product of um, all the work of everyone, obviously. And she also talked a lot about um, the communication that was required uh, to pull this all together. So. Um, communication really was one of the most important things, if not the most important thing in putting this tour together. And before doing any of the actual building for the tour, as she mentioned, we had a lot of general meetings where we brainstormed, talked about our goals for the project, and also reviewed the design document that um, H had worked on and that you guys all just saw. Uh, we had many meetings to check in with each other and to make sure we were all on track for our deadlines and we're um, making sure that everything was working together. And the collaboration with so many different people in so many disciplines and also with so many different backgrounds is really what made this tour come together so nicely, at least in my opinion. Um, so for the actual building, H and I worked very closely throughout the whole process. And we actually met every day, if not multiple times every day, one-on-one uh, -on -one over Zoom. And during the first couple of meetings, we really just familiarized ourselves with the software 3D Vista, which is what we used to build this tour mainly. We created um, a working tour in 3D Vista, which required a lot of detail, as H said, um, and because there are so many varying functions that are involved, as you got, as everyone saw, uh, with clicking different things, going to different levels of information and everything like that. We also took the time to establish a workflow for editing, converting, and importing the 3D pictures that eventually would turn into the tour. We used multiple softwares, including Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop alongside 3D Vista, which we used for graphics and also for touching up the photos that ended up getting stitched together. Throughout the building, I would create demos at different stages of the building and would send them to the team for them to review and have a prototype like product for them to be able to actually see. So for example, after I'd worked on the movement between panoramic pictures in a specific location like uh, the forest, I created a video where you could see me moving through that area. It was only a quick minute long video that I gave them that just gave a bare bones idea of what the final product could look like. Um, it didn't have you know, all the fancy things, but you're able to see just the basic workings of it. And I would often voice over what was going on and explain how I put that together and also the different options for how we could move forward so that the team could meet and speak about um, what we wanted to do in the future. And then later on in the process, after the core functionality was mainly finalized, we worked in conjunction with the design team to create the user interface, which uh, will be talked about a little bit later on. 
Thank you so much. Um, I just noticed our agenda and I actually, Richard's was going to start with the history. So we're going to scoot back to Richard. Um, Richard's and thank you so much for giving us such a great overview of, the, of this very complicated process that we are now experts in understanding 3D tours. But Richard's, why don't you take over? Thank you. Sure, uh, everybody can hear me okay? So, uh, so I'm Dr. Richard Plavnix, and uh, I got my PhD in 2013 in, in modern German history. And I wrote my dissertation about the Holocaust in Latvia and more specifically about post-war trials of Holocaust perpetrators from Latvia. And over the course of all that research, it's since been published as a book and translated into Latvian, I had heard Jungfernhof. Uh, so you occasionally, it, it crops up in the sources, but all the, all the references to it were always really kind of like marginal, offhand. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be thrown in with other parts of the genocidal network that the Nazis built in Latvia, but I never really encountered a source that was about Jungfernhof, ever. Uh, you know, whereas you can find books about the Riga ghetto and so on, but, but not about Jungfernhof. So, there I was minding my own business in uh, September 2019, and Karen Frostig cold called me uh, to, to, uh, to ask me if I wanted to get involved in, in, a, in a project concerning recovering the memory of Jungfernhof. Uh, and so that was when my involvement in the project began. And so the first thing I did was to, to find out whether or not the US Holocaust Memorial Museum had any information. Uh, so so the USHMM undertook a decade long project to um, uh, account for all of the sites of Nazi persecution in Europe during the Second World War. And they came up with 40,000 sites, camps and ghettos. Uh, and they have organized information about these sites into a giant multi-volume encyclopedia as part of their camps and ghettos project. And volume six, which is not yet published, will include Karen and I's article about the Jungfernhof camp, uh, which we wrote in the uh, summer of 2020. And so where does the information about Jungfernhof come from? So Karen mentioned that 148 of the roughly 4,000 Jews who were deported to the site survived the war. And many of them testified in post-war trials in West Germany. And so we have their testimony from the court records. Uh, they also published memoirs and, uh, and there are other publications that various subgroups of that survivor group uh, subsequently published. And so I relied on those for most of my information. Um, of course, Evan Robbins and Frank Zimmick have been absolutely indispensable. I've done, I'm almost guilty to say this, but <laughs> Despite being the lead historian, I myself, after that initial canvas, uh, haven't done very much additional research into the, um, you know, the nitty gritty of the claims made by the survivors and so on. But Evan and Fred have done a ton of work, uh, including archival work that has helped me write most of the material that you can find on the website uh, and some other articles that are sort of in the works right now. One thing that I wanted to make a point out of is the issue, so one of the issues that the team had was how to describe what happened to this camp after 1945, uh, which is to say, why was it that when I was, you know, reading sources and so on, writing my dissertation, that Jungfernhof was never really uh, a focus of anything? Jungfernhof was never uh, uh, focused on as a object of research itself, and very little attention has ever been paid to the camp. I mean, even to this day, uh, it remains, and this is the word that we uh, finally, I think, agreed upon, not forgotten. It was never forgotten. It was never first swept under the rug or denied. It was unremembered. And so the mission of the project really has been to remember the camp, finally. And I've written an essay that's not published yet, um, uh, sort of speculating about why the camp sort of receded from memory uh, 
uh, in the years from 1945 when the Second World War ended all the way up to the present. But I think nothing highlights the importance of remembering places like this than the, uh, the creation of a recreational park at the site uh, starting in 2013. So they, they built a prom the Latvian, you know, the, 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 the city of Riga undertakes this beautification project. They build a promenade and bird watching towers and bike paths and parking lots. Uh, and that began in 2013. And lo and behold, they were building over a mass grave. In, fa in fact, two mass graves. Uh, a mass grave that was attested to in, in witness literature. Uh, and then, uh, and, and Ilya Lensky, the director of the uh, Jewish Museum in Riga, guided the scientific team of Dr. Richard Freund to the site at the, at the former site of the camp, which is expansive. Uh, that, 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 you know, we thought was the most likely place described in the witness testimony to, you know, where the grave might be located. And they located the appropriate disturbances under the soil with science. Uh, and, and so there it is. And they built a park over it. And so nothing really uh, highlights the hazard of not remembering these things uh, uh, more than that episode does. Uh, it, 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 it is necessary uh, for, for people to recognize what happened there uh, because numerous countries are implicated. Obviously, Germany and Austria, which is, uh, you know, the, the, the Reich government orchestrated the Holocaust under Hitler, uh, and the victims were sent from cities in Germany and in Austria to this site. Numerically, the majority of the perpetrators of the Holocaust at this site were not German, they were Latvian, members of the Latvian Auxiliary Security Police. Uh, and in fact, the only dedicated German personnel at the site was the Commandant himself, Rudolf Seck, who was prosecuted in West Germany in the 1950s and convicted. Uh, and so unremembered is really the best word, I think, uh, certainly the best word our group is fine to describe. Uh, the site, and uh, we seek to remedy that. And I'm really, I really hope that the audience has questions because I could, like, uh, you know, like H, I could, I could, uh, uh, you know, speak on this, you know, more or less indefinitely. Uh, it's really been a fascinating uh, experience for me uh, getting into this stuff and also collaborating with the team. So uh, having meetings where we're, you know, uh, making decisions about how to how to present the timeline information, uh, and um, you know, and various other inputs that I've had into the process has been really uh, pretty invigorating. Because as you know, most of the time for historians, all we do is sit in our archives uh, and in front of our computers writing. And so this has been really a breath of fresh air. And the Zoom technology is just incredible. I've never met any of these people. <laughs> I've, ne I've never even met Karen. Uh, and, and yet we've put this together uh, over, over a two year or whatever period. Uh, and I feel really close to everybody on the team at this point, uh, which I would never have imagined when I picked up that phone in my office in September of, of 2019, that I would make all, all these new friends all across the world. Uh, and while doing something that I think is really important, and I'm proud of everything that we've achieved. Uh, so I will leave it there, but I look forward to questions about the history of the site. Thank you so much. As you can see, we, we can't stop talking about this. Um, and there's just, we're in love with this project. Um, Ilya, we're gonna to turn to you now. You are the, the anchor, the, the Latvian anchor of this project. You're the director of the Jewish Museum in Latvia, and you are the expert, you are the person on the ground. Please join us in. Yeah, so I'll uh, I'll just share the presentation, as with everybody hoping that it works. <laughs> so um, I don't know if you do see my screen. Yes. Uh, great. So um, so basically, that's how the place of Jungfrenhof looks like more or less today. Yeah. So it's the photo from um, 2020. Uh, so, I first encountered this site in 2006 uh, when I've just started working in the museum and we had the project of demarcation 
of Holocaust sites in Latvia. Altogether, there are um, about 130 Holocaust sites in Latvia, killing sites, burial sites, reinterment sites, and so on. And so we were exploring them. So we went with uh, several colleagues from our museum, including uh, Dr. Magdus Vesterman is our founder, who himself is a Holocaust survivor, uh, and who was once brought uh, as a prisoner of Riga ghetto to participate in preparation uh, of um, Jungfrenhof uh, for them, um, uh, for the imprisonment of um, German and Austrian Jews. And, and the, the fourth participant was then ambassador of Germany to Latvia. So there were big plans to commemorate something. Um, we're in 2022, there is still um, unfortunately no memorial sign there. Uh, we can talk at length why, but I would not. So what's important, uh, you can see uh, that uh, this is an area rather distant from Riga city center. So there is nothing around it. There are fields on one side and the upper part you can see, and then there are garden allotments here, which significantly um, expanded in the 80s and 90s, so which take part of the territory of the camp. Then there is a pond and there are several buildings. So most important, one, two, three. But if we would go 105 years earlier, um, uh, sorry. Uh, something. Sometimes, uh, it, yeah. Sometimes it doesn't click real good. All right. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, we'll do like that. Okay. So uh, this is the aerial photo taken in 1917 during the First World War, and so here you can see the same. You can see the pond, and then you see plenty of buildings. Uh, and so these buildings were all kind of agricultural buildings because Jungfrenhof initially was just a rural manor. It was about 10 kilometers from the city of Riga. And uh, there were plenty of such manors around uh, the town, which were used as summer residences by wealthy citizens or as permanent residences by noble families. Particularly, this manor was owned by the city of Riga. Uh, it was prominent for its water mill, uh, which was one of the oldest. Um, so here you can see the water mill and this pond was initially a mill pond. And so then you can see the stream uh, down. And then so there was a um, water wheel uh, that powered the mill. And then there were all kind of agricultural buildings, horse stables, warehouses, and here is the manor house. The problem is that we almost do not have photos of the area. Uh, it was uh, very much abandoned in 1920s and 1930s. There were attempts to install there an agricultural school, but, uh, but it was mostly abandoned due to damage it suffered during the First World War because it was a uh, so the front line went along Daugava River. So, so it was damaged during the warfare in, uh, in the First World War and, and a bit later. So after uh, the Nazi invasion, it was turned into concentration camp. And then uh, in 1944, when Latvia was reoccupied by the Soviets, who have already controlled Latvia between 1940 and 41, uh, the construction of the military airfield started in the vicinity. So here you can see the plan of big territory. It's planned from 1947. And uh, so here in the lower left corner, you can see Jungfrenhof. And so it's the, the, this plan is called the project of the allocating land for construction of Rumbula airfield. Rumbula is the name of the area. And so here you can see uh, the proposed runway uh, area. And initially, Infernhof had not to be included. Uh, and if we take a look, we can see that there are still plenty of buildings. 
And the listing mentions uh, 16, 17 buildings at that moment in 1917, most of them masonry structures. Uh, then we try to understand what, what are these buildings? And we have a striking document because actually why it is important because many of the memoirs which Richard, uh, Richards, Richards mentioned, they allude to certain buildings. People who were imprisoned in the camp were kept in these agricultural buildings. There were almost no on purpose built structures except for only one, this U-shaped uh, building, which was constructed in 1942 after mass killing. So when uh, about 450 prisoners uh, survived, so they were, for them was constructed this special new barrack. So, so we had to understand how to match the story and the topography. So we have on that basically only one source. And this is this plan. Most shocking thing concerning it is who drew it. So this um, plan was drawn by Rudolf Zeck, the commandant of the camp. So it's the kind of arc perpetrator testifying to what he has uh, perpetrated. The problem with this plan, which includes big territory. So here is Daugava River, what you've seen on the aerial photo. And here is Chiruatava railway station where the trains arrived. And here is the major street, uh, Moscow Street currently. The problem is that uh, there is no scale on this map and there is no basically proper topography. So we do not really understand how, what is mutual relation between and distance between these buildings. And so if we know that Commandatur is the manor house, then we can understand that, for example, this building called Lazarette is located somewhere nearby and should be perpendicular to the Commandatur building. But that's basically all we know. And then you see what's ironic. We do not see the pond here, which is a very visible topographic object. So, so then we go to post-war time. So maybe post-war plans can show us anything. And yes, on this 1947 plan, uh, you can see actually still a lot of the buildings on the territory. So the same as on this, so to say, secret map of land being allocated for the airfield, you can see here a lot of buildings and they're overlapped. I've overlapped this plan with contemporary um, open street map, uh, which shows here is the pond. So for you understand, still, still you can see this U-shaped building which was constructed by the Nazis. And then the same area in 1963. So you see that most of the buildings are already gone. For us, the biggest problem was to identify the buildings and to understand what has survived, what has not. So this overlapping uh, really helps and we can see that till today survives on the Commandatur building, the two buildings or one elongated building here, actually these are two buildings joined together uh, and former mill building here which uh, on the open street map, you can see it is marked as the museum because as a part of creation of this um, uh, park, uh, it was converted in the Riga Water Mill Museum. The problem is that the plan drawn by Zach doesn't mention the mass grave. Um, and so that's why bringing the team of Professor Richard Freund was so important. So I would, a little bit correct, Richard, so no one was building over the mass grave. And so actually there was not much uh, amendments done to the area between 2013 and 2020, 2021. So most important thing that the bushes were cleaned, this area was terribly overgrown, the rubbish was cleaned, the uh, mill pond was filled in, and here on the side, of the camp was 
uh, made a parking lot so you can see the preparation works for it. So here is the parking lot. The exploration by Professor Richard Freund showed that the trench, which looks like mass grave or two mass graves, uh, is located approximately from here and going in this direction. So I hope you see my pointer. So, so that's, that's where the mass grave is. And for us, crucially important was that all the evidences mentioned, and here we go back to this drawing that the corpses of the victims were piled uh, during the winter of 1941-42 next to the barn, which stood on the side of the central court uh, of the manor. And then the grave was created at the same area. And so here we can see, for example, a freestanding barn at the site of the something we can refer to as central court of the camp. And so it makes sense. So if corpses were piled somewhere here, so then the grave is also somewhere here. Uh, we hope that the explorations this summer would bring more clarity so we can clearly demarcate the grave and then proceed with proper memorialization. So I will stop at this point and I would be glad to take questions afterwards or whatever the reglement would choose. Thank you so much. We are going to continue. I hope at this point you can see how no one could do this project alone, that we are dependent on each, on each other's skills and expertise. Um, and the excitement of the 3D tour really helps us understand how we can actually walk inside this camp today. Many people cannot get to the camp. And so this tour is critical in bringing this history forward. Thank you so much. We are now going to hear from Shalini and Marissa, um, integrative designers, and then we're going to conclude with Evan and Fred. So let's keep going as we continue. Yes, Shalini. Oh you can hear me all right, right, yeah. I mean, talk about, um, you know, echoing what Zan and Richard had spoken about, a transdisciplinary collaboration. I wanna start there. And that's been an incredibly invigorating experience for me to be in this environment where all of us, you know, different disciplines just coming together, there was this mutual respect, curiosity to understand what each, each one does um, to, to present the knowledge of what the expertise you bring into this and all of it anchored by the singular, pure, honest intent to tell this story, a story that is so um, relevant, that is so tenuous, and it's so compelling. For me, it's I get goosebumps just thinking about it. I have a personal interest in the history of this of the time. And also um, the role of a designer as a storyteller within our social cultural ethos. And there is also a lot of things come together here, which, and I'm with the help. Where are you, Marissa? Oh, you're right there. And so, yeah, and Marissa was a lovely support, both of us collaborating with H and the team, and I'll, but I'll get to it. So uh, talking about the, uh, how the sausage was made, right? Our meetings, our powwows, and, it, and it's just like this curiosity, everybody with our, all our neuroses and understanding and, but allowing, being receptive to each other's opinions. That was just lovely. I know, uh, Karen, you have lots of those recordings that we did, you know, where we're going through stuff back and forth. But from a design perspective, there were two levels that I would break it down. There was the macro and the micro. The macro was this, the broad strokes. How do you, you have this robust data. So that lots of our talks were, how do we unravel it to the user, right? That was where we sort of, you know, had this sort of conversations on how do we tell the story? How do we break down the levels of wisdom, which some of it, you know, come through in the 3D tour. It's almost how do we open each chapter of the book when there's so much, it can be overwhelming. How do you put, put, put it in that step to step by step process? That was one, you know, the, just the power of storytelling and the narrative, how we're breaking that down. And the second was the more the micro, really looking at um, the graphic system. You know, we brainstormed the color. You know, again, the subject is so 
so powerful and so pertinent and tenuous. You have to be respectful. Nothing has to be gimmicky. Every, every choice we made had to be universal, had to speak a common language, had to pay respect or pay homage to what we're trying to really say. So there was this wonderful balance and brainstorming right down to that nitty gritty of what type we're using, what, what the interface looks like. So that was really an overall exciting experience. And Marissa, you know, she really worked so comprehensively and I'll allow you, Marissa, you talk about, you know, developing those icons and, uh, you know, all those little tweaks and, you know, working with H and the team. And I'll give it to you, Marissa, what your thoughts were on that. And Yeah, thanks, Shalini. I mean, wow, what an important project for me to be a part of. Um, again, a designer's role is to tell a story that not only has been um, not in this case forgotten, but that is unremembered. And like Shalini said, when it comes to the colors of some of the 3D tour parts that we chose to echo the um, importance of the story, we wanted something not too heavy, something that would just be easy on everyone. And I found that in the case, the color waves and the type choice that we found was a perfect coherence of two. And to be able to work with H and Zan on this project, I mean, broaden my horizons. I'm a student and everything is just blown away out of proportion. I thank Karen and Shalini for guiding me and helping me with everything that I was able to do. And nothing was straightforward. Nothing was simple. Everything was highly chaotic and complex. And I love H for bearing my neurosis of saying, oh, but the alignment, the type alignment, the letting, we have, we've got so much to fix. And I, I know it's still a work in process, but your receptiveness, H, and your understanding of, you know, our design aesthetic. It was, it was <laughs> all amazing. the tedious work of aligning yeah. everything is, yes, yes. takes so much time, but yes. I learned a lot. And uh, I think one thing that I can say about this whole team is that we've all adapted a lot uh so you know design team would say give me a write-up on this like four sentences only and then a, like a historian is like okay i'll just you know condense all of this into that so um i loved how we all adapted into this um for the project <laughs> so, so i'm going to uh move us along um you know it's it's hard to leave one one presentation for the next um we don't have time to look at the timeline. Um, I just want to show it to you visually, and I want to then move to Evan and Fred so we have time for questions. Um, I also want to just clarify the reason why this project began was because my grandparents were murdered at the site. So that was my knowledge of how I got here. And that's kind of like, oh, that's really the point. People were murdered here. Um, and, that is, and that is the deep feeling that we bring to this project of respect. And Fred also is the son of a survivor who's, who will be speaking. So can we just look quickly at the um, gorgeous um, uh, timeline? Um, Richards, could you say like two minutes about this timeline? One minute, <laughs> no pressure. Okay. Sure, so uh, obviously the, uh, the Nazi concentration camp that was built at this site is not the only thing that was ever there. Uh, so we already mentioned there's a park there nowadays, uh, but the actual history of the site goes back to the um, a German crusade that was launched uh, in the Baltic region at the very, very end of the 1100s. Uh, and so the first documented activity at the site dates from the middle of the 1200s, and it's been more or less continuously occupied from then until the present. And so, that means that you know, the, the various travails of the people who lived in the territory that eventually became today's Republic of Latvia are kind of revealed in microcosm just by examining you know, the various trends and changes and, uh, and so on that you can observe just at this site. So we tried to build a timeline that would very, very quickly, just visually in a simple way, uh, orient visitors uh, to, to so that they could situate the, the Nazi history of the site within the broader history of the site and indeed the country of Latvia. And it was tricky, but, but, but what's interesting is that, you know, I, did, I, I wrote up a history, I think it's like five or 10 pages long, uh, you know, documenting more or less, you know, the, 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 the trajectory. And, and it was just an essay. And 
if I just dis I distilled the key information from that essay and gave it to Shalini, who then just magically produced a beautiful uh, um, you know artifact here. And it's interesting that when when you cross the dis disciplinary lines and and start to involve people with other areas of expertise, you discover that there are more that there's more than one way to communicate a fact. Uh, and here, you know, color coding the 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 relationship, spatial relationship between the information, all of that conveys information too, just in a different way than an essay does. And I think this is, uh, uh, you know, a, just a, a really good example of a collaborative um, you know, the result of a collaborative effort. So I, I beg Shalini, you know, just, just a simple timeline, and this is what she produced, which is so gorgeous. One very quick observation, the part that interests me the most is that there were two years only um, in the history of Latvia in one place, the Jungfernhof concentration camp, where there were more Jews than Latvians and then Germans. They were of course all murdered, but it was the only time in history where there were more Jews than there were any other group. I'm going to um, stop this sh slide sharing and move it to Evan and Fred um, as our concluding speakers. Please listen carefully. I think you'll be very moved by this. And then we'll move to questions. So let's keep going. Okay, I can jump in here. Um, before I begin, Karen, I just wanna ask, do you think we have time for the recording or yes, should we yes, just- yes. we have to. Okay. Okay, so I'll just speak for a minute. So, um, hi everyone. I'm I'm Evan Robbins, a researcher on the project, and together with Fred Zimmick, who's a, um, as Karen just mentioned, a descendant of a camp survivor and a, a historian, and um, we've produced those four audio recordings that accompany the 3D tour, which we looked at very briefly earlier. Um, the intention behind these recordings is to to bring out elements of the lived experience of camp life in connection with that investigation of the physical space. Um, and I'd say in particular, we're trying to call attention to the, the subtle details, the, the feelings and shadows of, of that day-to-day -day life, which can often be pushed to the background in other kinds of histories. Um, and I think in as sort of objects in and of themselves, they can also be um, a, a very accessible way of accessing this history as short recordings, given that the material is, is very difficult and traumatic. Um, so we've used a combination of sources, um, overlapping with uh, what Richards was mentioning earlier, so trial testimony, memoir, also oral history archives. And then we focused on four topics, so selections and death, um, water, water and hygiene, forced labor, and a, um, and a 1942 hanging at the camp. Um, I just would very quickly also like to thank Fred for his incredibly devoted and diligent research on these topics, um, even when it was incredibly difficult for him to do so. Um, so I'm now gonna play the selections in depth uh, recording, which is about three and a half minutes. Um, this is primarily based um, on a letter from Fred's father. Um, the, the version that we're going to play now is, is in English that I've recorded, um, but the one that I would really like people to engage with as we integrate it more is one in which Fred reads his father's letter um, in the original German. But for today's purposes, we'll, we'll look at this one. Which one did you wanna pick here? So it's the second one there. This, uh, the selection. Yeah. Okay. Between the arrival of the deportees in winter 1941 and the Dunamunda action mass killing of March 1942, over 1,300 of the 4,000 inmates of Jungfernhof perished. For families in Jungfernhof during this time, daily life was a struggle for survival. 800 of these inmates were lost to illness, freezing temperatures, and other effects of the camp's inhumane conditions. Every day, the body commando had to search the barracks for dead bodies and bring them to the camp roll call. Due to the bitter winter of 1942, the ground was frozen solid, so the bodies could not be buried. Instead, they were brought to a nearby field where in February 1942, the ground was blown up and they were buried in a mass grave. The Nazis also selected several groups of old and ill inmates, totaling 500 to 600 for mass killings. They informed those remaining in the camp that the chosen inmates had been taken to the infirmary in the Riga ghetto. These groups were transported in open trucks or buses to a nearby forest where they were then shot. For Leonard Zimek, 
the survivor of the camp deported from Hamburg with his wife Elsa, son Danny, mother Helen, and father Otto, these threats were ever present. Here, Leonard describes camp life in a post-war letter to his sister. Shortly before Christmas, father developed a fever and complained about pain in his lungs. He did not get up on Christmas Eve and felt very bad. The doctor determined he had pneumonia and rib inflammation. Here began the most difficult time for me. Mother was also sick with stomach pain and vomiting. Elsa went to the infirmary with a sore throat and the child had measles. At the same time, we had nothing to eat because we did not have our luggage. It was the worst for my father who always had an appetite and yet there was nothing. But what else could I do? There were many suitcases lying around in the dirt. I organized several and snuck out from the camp during the night to trade with the farmers to get at least a little bread. I exchanged the winter clothes that we had on us for meat and fat so that at least the sick had something to eat. My greatest happiness was that mother and Elsa were helped back onto their feet. Our father decided to eat only a little because he knew how hard I had worked to acquire everything. The child also recovered and prospered despite all the hardship. In the meantime, there were daily roll calls and people were taken away. We were told they were being taken to the Rika ghetto and we were so naive as to believe it. Since we wanted to remain together, I always hid my parents until that moment when there was a surprise roll call. My mother had just gone across the yard and was taken away. I only saw her waving from a distance. That was all. Since then, I have not heard from her. This was on February 10th, 1942. There were 600 other older people taken away at that time. Father got increasingly ill, and in the afternoon on February 22nd, 1942, at 3.30 p.m., he calmly fell asleep in my arms. He still lies with 600 other shot, hanged, frostbitten Jews, and a single mass grave in Jungfernhof. As such, our father died rather normally. Weeks later, Leonard's wife, Elsa, and son, Danny, perished in the Dunamunda action. Yes. Um, Fred, can you just say a couple of words? We need to hear from you. Okay. Do you hear me good? Yes. Uh, as you heard, my father's uh, family, after some months, they were, he had lost them all. You can see his wife and his son Elsa and his son Danny above here, uh, my half-brother. Half and then you see my grandparents, Otto and Helene Simak. And then you have my father down there also. Uh, in 1943, my father came to SSLSD car workshop, Lenta in Riga. He had to work at the Russian front. Uh, if you ask why he didn't escape to the Russians, he was not able to do that. His legs were shamed and he could only do small steps. In the September 1944, the Russian front came closer. Most still living inmates came to Stuttgart, not far from Gdansk, Poland today. Uh, my father, with around 230 other, came as lost from Riga to Harbor Town, Liba, today Lipeja, Latvia. Uh, here, several inmates died in Russian bomb attacks. In 1945, February, the Russian front also came close here and they were transported with ship to Hamburg. And in the middle of April 1944, the English army was very close to Hamburg. So most from the Riga group with around 600 other inmates must have to do a death march to Kiel in northern Hamburg, Germany. Uh, they had to walk around 85 kilometers in four days. And you have to remember, they were in very bad shape. Uh, uh, they had bad clothes, bad shoes. Well, they had very little for. These nine people were killed on this death march. Um, not no one from the Riga group. 
uh, they arrived in the so-called working education camp more back outside Kiel, from many in the Riga group mentioned as the most terrible camp of all. Beasts looking as humans, my father wrote in his letter. He was knocked unconscious with an iron bar from the so-called killing beater. He had luck that he survived. The friends brought him in a barrack and he suffered many years of the war from those. On 31st, 1st April 1945, the Riga group got the information that they will come to Sweden next day. They thought this was a lie and that they would be killed the next day. On 1st May 1945, they had to stand up early and wait for hours. Then the Danish white buses from Red Cross arrived and they were rescued to Sweden. This was one week before war end. Coming from hell to heaven, uh, Battle Cole writes, also one who was in Jantrenhof. Uh, my parents never talked about those times. Of course, I know what they experienced, more, but most what I know is to this letter from my father to his sister and what others have written about this. My mother, who still lives in Stockholm and just was 97 years old, she never remembers when I asked her about this time. Uh, one year ago, I came in contact with Karen through a Facebook group, uh, and then I found a lot of new information about Jungfrenau, and I read everything I could read, read about that. Uh, and you should really be grateful for Karen and her, her team that they pick up and remember more about Jungfrenau. You should really honor them. They have done a fantastic work, a very hard work, all of them here, to get what they have done now. It was also great working with Evan. He also uh, came with uh, very difficult questions always. <laughs> um, finally, usually when I talk about those terrible times, I try to do it a little more political. Uh, in this context, there are three sentences that are very important. Never forget, never again, we did not know. And never forget, at least in Germany, is very good in this. I cannot speak for other countries. Uh, I don't know so much about this. But the two last, we did not know and never again. We are all very bad in. Uh, we have this terrible invasion from Russia and Ukraine now. It is very easy to condemn Putin and Russia for what they do, but you also have to look at your own countries have done or do. You have to dig where yourself are. There are more killed people in conflicts around the world after World War II than during World War II. When I six years ago started with this, project about our book, there were around 65 million refugees in the world. And before the invasion of Ukraine was now around 80 million refugees around the world. And our part of the world was or is often involved in conflict. And today, often in the name of democracy, even if it's not about power and money. I'm always surprised that when you look what happened with the money, and you also open, uh, you understand why tough conflicts happen, my opinion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank everyone on this project team. I hope you all got a, a, a presentation and an experience of the talent and the commitment um, and the mutual regard that we all feel for each other, which I, I'm just so grateful that we are working together. Um, it looks like they haven't cut off the electricity to this group, so I think we can proceed with a couple of questions. Um, I also just want to quickly mention that in addition to this group, we now have a survivor and heirs group. Um, and in that group, we have three survivors that meet with us once a month. Um, so this project just touches on so many levels, so many voices, so much contact, but I think 
you know, as we're thinking about all of what we're collecting here, and I think of ourselves as reluctant collaborators because we are all so deeply absorbed with our own ideas and our own research. Um, I think you can now see the value of the 3D tour that for the first time, people can walk inside this camp. How amazing that is. Um, and for those of you, and my friend Karen, uh, Von Trotter is here from Germany. She can speak again of Germany and, and what it's like to try to make this memory, these links and these bridges. Why don't we open it up to questions? If you have questions, just raise your hand. We'll take five minutes more of questions. How does that sound? Is that sounds good? So if anyone has questions, we're eager to hear from you. Remember, this is participatory, collaborative. We'd love to hear your reactions. Carol raised hand. Yes. Hi. Yeah, so, so there is a question about link to the uh, interface and website, and there is a, someone lifted a hand as well. Yes. So just speak up, just with your question. Thank yes. you. I, I'm homesick, which is why I don't have my, my camera on. Um, so this is incredible. Uh, I, I did have a question for uh, Richards about, or for all of you, how um, just how incredibly difficult it must have been to work with the current um, government there um, as far as, you know, wow, you put a park over and mass graves in the concentration camp here. Like, I'm just curious about some little piece you can share on that because that sounds very challenging. I would, I would also like to bring Ilya into that response. He's, he's right there in Latin. Yeah, so uh, it was not challenging at all. So, because uh, actually the local municipality uh, was, I'll call it moderately sympathetic to the project. So the thing is that before uh, Karen started this project in 2000, let's say early 2019 or late 2018, uh, there was only a kind of general knowledge about mass grave. And for example, we as the museum and as the Jewish community we never seriously were searching for it. So our idea was commemorating the story of the camp. Uh, I think he froze. And I can jump in until yeah. until Ilya comes uh, back. back. But I, I I do think it's more oh, appropriate think... to have. Hmm? I was Sorry, I say, think... no. no, H, go ahead. I just noticed Ilya is looking confused, so I just wanted to. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm listening, Richard. Go oh, on. Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, no, no, no. If Ilya is back, then, then I, I'll, I'll defer to Ilya. <laughs> Sorry, uh, yeah. technology. So, 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 what is important? Nobody considered looking for a grave because what we knew from the sources that the grave is in the potato field, and we presumed that uh, all these garden allotments have been built over it in the eighties. So, so basically. Uh, Karen Hoare communication with the municipality brought up the idea of the mass grave and they said okay go on look for the mass grave and so then we'll return to the question of proper uh, memorialization so the biggest challenge in communication with the authorities were actually the changes in the municipality that happened in the course of the project it had nothing to do with holocaust commemoration with anything so just it was a municipal reform in Riga and so if in this early stage of the project we had to communicate with one body and basically one person very much one person and his advisors so currently there are several different bodies in Riga municipality uh, which are interest are which are responsible for this area and for none of them area of Jungfrenhof is a love child. So nor, they, uh, nor the recreational area is love child, nor the memorial is love child. So actually we are still in pretty good position in the sense of you know, communication with the authorities. So if it was not for the COVID, we would be much, much further now. But of course, COVID um, is a great mess. So that's, that's briefly. It doesn't sound brief, but it's actually brief with the story of our relations with authorities. Thank you so much, Ilya. I also uh, I'd like to also oh 
So I was gonna, I was just gonna add on to that uh, just a little bit. Uh, so Ilya has given you, uh, uh, you know, an explanation of the project's relationship to the local authorities who have not been uncooperative. I don't, I, I wouldn't say, um, but it, but the implication of the question is also important. So everywhere that the Nazis influenced and controlled over the course of World War II, um, in all of those different countries, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania. Romania and Hungary, which were allies of Nazi Germany, everywhere that the Holocaust occurred, it occurred differently in each national context. And then after 1945, each nationality uh, uh, engaged in what the Germans call Vergangenheitsbewältigung, which is grappling with the past differently, because they all experienced the post-war under different political circumstances, either reoccupied by the Soviet Union, or part of Moscow's Eastern Bloc you know, Imperium or Western NATO allies. And, and so for every nationality involved that is implicated as, at, at, in co-perpetrating the Holocaust to one degree or another, the, the process of, of acknowledging and reckoning with that collaboration has been different. And so where does Latvia lie on that spectrum? That's a, a a very big question, you know, that you would need really a book to, to answer. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, uh, certainly on, on the, you know, Latvia definitely falls on the more favorable end of the spectrum without, you know, really, really deep recriminations between the Jewish community and, and you know, national spokespeople with, with no, you know, Holocaust denial in academia the way there exists in Romania today. Uh, mostly, mostly it's ignorance of the Holocaust and not hostility to the idea that Latvians had committed crimes. Um, and also there's, there's also the issue of Latvian victimization at the hands of the Nazis, not to mention the Soviets all the way up to 1991. So it's a very complicated, messy um, issue. But I, wouldn't, I would really hate for people to get the message that the park was built over this camp as some kind of nefarious intentional effort to erase the Holocaust from Latvian history and so on, because it's definitely not that. It, it's really the hazard of not remembering, which is why that happened, which is why we agreed to, to re refer to the camp as unremembered rather than forgotten, deliberately ignored, or, or so and so on. So I really thank you for that question because it, it's really a, 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 a very important one. Um, and I just want to know that one thing that about how Latvia is not a post-Holocaust memory, Richard's book, which is dedicated to Latvian perpetrators of the Holocaust, has been for a while a bestseller in Latvia and received positive reviews and there was a big interview with Richard's in a, let's say, national conservative newspaper. And also what's uh, important, uh, so there, there are different levels of national and municipal involvement in Holocaust related projects. And generally municipalities are rather involved because it deals with their own people. And the problem with Jungfrenhof, one of the problems is that the prisoners there were not Latvian prisoners. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so these are people to whom, to whom many you know, people in the municipality, they do not have sort of affiliation and association. Yeah, so, but, but again, it's a very long story why it is unremembered. It would take another hour and a half. I, I think, and we are going to wind down, and I'm sorry that Cabin Levinson left because he has been actively a part of this project. Um, he's my son, and um, he was involved in the Vienna project, and he had a perspective to offer in that regard, but he had another meeting to go to. Um, it is so... Uh, it, it stirs so much relationship with Ukraine right now and with the issue of what does it mean when you become stateless, when you move, when you're, a, you, when you're a migrant, when you lose your homeland, you know, the kind of upset, you know, who cares? And right now, I think what we're seeing is the world cares. In 1941, 1942, the world did not care. And now we're seeing a response. But is it enough? Um, I wonder in terms, of, is there one more question that we can take or one thing I thought we might want to close with? There is um, a 20 minute video that we're not going to close with that we're very involved in making. It's just about done. Um, there is a closing paragraph of that um, 
that video that Richards wrote that I think might be apropos for us to close with. And I'm just going to open up the screen so we can see it. Um, and I don't know who would like to read this. Is there anyone, Richards, you wrote it? But I think, you know, as we sit here and wonder the relationship between this camp, this history today, what's happening in Ukraine, um, you know, the word never forget, is that adequate? You know, how do we make, how do we make this memorial um, engaging so that it's more than never forget? Richards, do you want to read this? I certainly can. Okay, good. Uh, so so Jungfernhof is a painful piece of history that connects Germans, Austrians, Latvians, and Jews. It reminds all who look upon it that there are no limits to the cruelty that human beings can inflict on one another. As we make our way into the future together, we should remember this history for our own sakes as moral beings, for all humanity, and for the memory of all who died here. I think that is um, a good message to close with. Um, and um, I hope we get to continue this project so that we can continue to develop this work and take it to its next level. I thank everyone for coming and staying to the last minute. And I'm deeply grateful to this project team and how we work together. It's, it's a thrilling experience. Even though I have many sleepless nights, <laughs> I enjoy the process. Thank you very much, and we will see you again. <laughs>